So we'll, we'll get underway. So welcome everyone to the Ascolite Mobile Learning Special Interest Group. And uh, today we've got a guest um, with us, Dr. Charles um, Sevigny. I hope I pronounced that right, probably not. Leave the G out, just 70, it's fine. 70, okay. All right, a silent G, there we go. Se seven ye. <laughs> <laughs> so where did it originate from, Charles? France. France, okay, I wouldn't have guessed that, okay. It's originally de seven year. Okay. Very posh. Well, it's been um, Americanized, so no. <laughs> <laughs> and I've met Charles a few times uh, remotely because I'm still in Auckland and Charles is in Melbourne. And uh, we've been sort of knocking around ideas around immersive reality. So that's quite relevant to this group. Um, we've done quite a bit of um, work around immersive reality and uh, members of the group have got various specializations in that. Um, so just really wanted to sort of pick Charles's brain today and uh, get him to tell us what he's been doing, a um, bit of an outline of some of the projects he's been involved in. So I looked at Charles's profile, he's done like, like a million projects um, and hasn't written too many of them up. So um, <laughs> interesting to, uh, to get him to actually start writing a bit more about what he's done so we can you know, publicize that. So let's just go around and introduce each other. Um, on my screen, I have uh, Chris, Chris Deneen. Sure. Hi, I'm Chris Deneen, and I'm with the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education. And uh, I'm especially interested in assessment-related areas. And uh, a recent project that I've been working on across the university and beyond is the shift over to online open book examinations. And uh, I've written a guide for that, and I've been working with quite a few of the faculties, uh, including M MDHS. So, uh, yeah, good to be here, and welcome, Charles. I experimented a lot with that myself and my subject this semester. Uh, went yeah. quite well. It'd be good to pick your brain about that. Oh, absolutely. Um, next, I have Vickle. Vickle, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so Charles, Annabelle, and... Um, Andrew, I think. Yes, my name is Vickle. I'm from um, University of Sydney Business School. I'm an educational developer. So pretty much um, our move has been online. So all, almost all of business school has gone online for the coming semester. Of course, last semester was pretty much online as well. Thank you, Vickle. Um, uh, Neil? Uh, good morning. Um, I'm at uh, Okayama University in Japan. Uh, I'm an English teacher and I'm interested in e-learning in general and I'm making videos uh, in particular. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Lisa. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Lisa from Auckland University of Technology in Auckland. I used to work with both Vicol and Tom. Um, I'm a learning technologist slash designer um, and the special interest group has actually been quite valuable to me. And we have Annabelle. Oh, I'm uh, Annabelle Orchard. I'm at Melman Uni uh, in learning environments. So I'm a, a learning designer here. I um, have an interest in mobile learning. I worked on a research project at the Trobe on mobile learning devices when they were in their infancy. And I'm quite interested in the um, possibilities of uh, AR and VR for doing labs um, for technology enhanced learning and anything that gets us into remote labs while we can't get into the actual ones. Surprised we haven't crossed, crossed paths before, Annabelle, but I'm glad we did today. Yes, <laughs> good to meet you. And I, when I saw it, the topic, I thought, excellent, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have to pick your brains, uh, Annabelle. Um, so, Tom Worthington, next. Oh, good morning. Um, I'm a uh, honorary lecturer in the Research School of Computer Science at the ANU here in Canberra. Um, I've been teaching students how to write a job application. Um, recently. I'm just trying to think of my own earliest mobile use. I think maybe I took a Palm Pilot onto the USS Blue Ridge um, on exercise in the Coral Sea about 15 or 20 years ago. When did we have Palm Pilots? Yeah, early, <laughs> early 2000s, right. I think they kind of uh, were popular and then died. Um, David. <laughs> Hi, David. <laughs> Oh, Charles, nice to meet you. Hey. <laughs> David's my mentor, by the way, so we, we know each other quite well. <laughs> oh, 
I'm here actually to apologise for Charles after he says some of the things he says. <laughs> um, I'm David Williams. I'm the program. I'm at University of Melbourne, um, program director for biomedicine and chair of undergrad programs in the School of Biomedical Sciences. Um, been deeply interested in digital learning for for years. I suppose my research background was in digital imaging, so I love my tech and, and tech applied to learning is is a great combination. So. As I say, I'll apologise for you later, Charles. It'll be fine. Uh, thanks, Dave. <laughs> and I'll get to that other meeting you're dissing at some point. <laughs> and finally, we have uh, James, James Burt. G'day, everyone. Uh, I'm James Burt at Bond University. I'm one of the associate professors here. Um, I'm an academic and I teach and research into mobile mixed reality, uh, augmented and virtual reality. So I'm currently... Uh, preparing uh, remote learning materials for teaching uh, VR and AR for my students uh, and also uh, preparing for a blended learning classroom next trimester uh, where we will be uh, welcoming international and domestic students on campus via remote and blended learning technologies. <laughs> So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I work with uh, Tom, we've done some uh, editing of a journal and I publish in the area of mobile mixed reality. Yeah, so we might uh, might have to give a bit of a plug for our special uh, collection on immersive reality as well. So uh, it'd be nice to get you know some, some outputs perhaps from Charles and Annabelle and David uh, into that. Um, okay, so over to Charles. Um, Charles, it's... Um, yeah, been interesting sort of slightly getting to know you because, uh, you know, it's a little bit hard remotely, but um, um, quite interested to hear about some of the projects that you've been involved in. You seem to have done quite a lot in immersive reality. Uh, yeah, so I'm Charles Seventy. I'm the Director of Digital Learning for the School of Biomedical Sciences. Um, as a very brief historical background, I'm also a phys in the Department of Physiology. Uh, that's 60% of my time. Um, really, it's more like 160% and 140%, but you know how that works when you have a split role. Um, I, just as a very brief history, probably about two or three years ago, um, well, actually going back a little bit further than that, a colleague of mine were developing, um, he's a very talented animator using Blender, which is a 3D animation suite, um, developing online modules for students. And we were using Smart Sparrow as an adaptive learning platform. Um, and he was developing all these lovely 3D animations for us and we were working through uh, developing these modules to show students how things worked. And then ultimately we got up to the cardiovascular system and um, said, you know, I said, Jaris, could you please, uh, you know, just build me a heart. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we started building this heart and the thing became bigger than Ben-Hur. It was quite a project to get this thing clinically accurate. And we're talking to clinicians about building this three-dimensional animated uh, heart. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, what would be really cool is if I could sort of reach out and grab that heart and hold it and rotate it. Um, and so we went out and got a couple of Oculus Rift VR headsets um, and deployed it in VR to start working uh, with that. And um, if you want to jump forward three years from that, now we have a, a gigantic um, virtual reality learning studio and the digital learning hub at the School of Biomedical Sciences. Um, we have uh, 16 uh, Oculus Rift CV1s and 40 Oculus Quests. Um, we're moving 2,000 students, uh, or a capacity of 2,000 students per week through VR activities, um, including that virtual reality heart, um, which we ended up building. And I just wanted to, um, we'll be fairly informal here, but I just have um, a few quick slides that I can take you through, and then I can show you some of the work we've been doing, if that's acceptable to you, Tom. Sounds great. Okay. Um, I apologize that um, these slides may come up a bit um, small on your screen. It's because I'm, I have a gigantic ultra wide over here. It's not a brag. I'm just telling you why these might come up a bit small. Um, can you see that all right? No. Oh, yes. It's just come up now. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, basically what we developed in the digital learning hub is a um, sort of five-spoked uh, digital learning ecosystem, um, collectively underpinned by the concept of students being collaborators and co-creators uh, in their academic experience, uh, working side by side with academics. And I can circle back to that a little bit later. Um, but we built um, infrastructure uh, for the capacity to deploy things like VR activities, AR activities, 
um, large touchscreen tables for um, virtual dissections, etc. Um, all underpinned by uh, the pedagogy, of course, uh, engagement across the learning community through activities like we're doing today. Um, development of digital literacy, both in students and um, our staff members, so professional development opportunities, learning opportunities for, for students and staff, um, and the actual development of novel uh, learning tools and platforms. Uh, so we were focused previously, of course, on this sort of face-to-face -face deployment aspect, um, but then once COVID came along and we all ended up at home, we were able to pivot quite easily uh, to focusing more on development uh, of new resources. Um, you, so we have, have a, um, I'll just butting in there. Um, no, that's fine. The, uh, the concept of the ecosystem, do you want to just go back one slide? Yep. So I'm just wondering if you had some theoretical foundations for the concept of your learning ecosystem or is it just a name you've come up with there? Tom, if you uh, basically something we just came up with, realizing sort of what priority areas we wanted to, to focus on for the school. Uh, but if you plug digital learning ecosystem into Google, you'll get the phone book. Yes. Um, yeah, yep. there is so, quite a significant body of literature around it. So I was just wondering if you're referring to anything specific there. Or, well, I, I focused mostly on our own capacity, um, what we were able to focus on um, with, our, with the resources that we had uh, and what aligned with our school's priorities. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's most, mostly what we put together. The idea of this um, collaborators and co-creators um, really is stemming from our new Flex App program and also some impressive things that I saw at the University of Sydney when I went up to visit where they had um, a similar but larger sort of university-wide um, digital learning uh, area where they had you know students and graduate students in there with them working on their own development projects and I thought that was uh, was really appealing uh, not only for the students to be able to do their own portfolio building um, but you know it's 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 a mutually beneficial relationship where students are developing content um, they're interacting um, and it was just a really fantastic thing to see so that's sort of where that stemmed from right um, so we're developing a whole bunch of different things, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the VR human heart as we work through. Um, we have the uh, a virtual reality knee and knee exam, which I'll give you a little sneak peek on. Um, a lot of just online various tools, interactive tools, and this is something that we had one of our um, undergraduate students develop uh, using JavaScript, these interactive graphs for biochemistry with protein charges. Uh, we've developed some um, uh, research type things. We developed a really cool 3D rat brain labeler for the development of images for publication. And the last thing I'll talk to you about today, which is our current thing I'm really excited about, which is Roslyn, which is um, because as many of you know, Smart Sparrow was an adaptive learning platform uh, that a lot of us were using. It got bought out by Pearson um, and we'll no longer have access to it at the end of the year. Um, and everybody was sort of scrambling a bit and we decided, well, uh, why don't we just build our own? Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that uh, as well. So just briefly on this virtual reality heart, which sort of was our uh, flagship for quite some time. Um, we developed this locally, it's clinically accurate, and yes, there are other VR hearts out there, but as a physiologist, every time I see one, they make me cringe a little bit because there's so many inaccuracies in them. I think they've gone more for an artistic approach than necessarily a clinical one. Uh, so that's what we're really focused on. And once we actually have the model constructed, which we do now, uh, we're, start, we're developing now scaffolded learning tools. So um, learning tools for first year students all the way through to graduate medicine um, to be able to uh, sort of build on uh, more complex concepts um, as you move through the different modules that we're developing. And the nice advantage of this VR heart um, and, and the reason we've gone to this, are you familiar with the SAMR model? Yes, uh, of, yes. Yep. But um, t talk us through it because people may not be. Oh, gosh, I wish I had a slide. Um, effectively, <laughs> it's almost the Bloom's taxonomy of, um, of digital education, if you will. Um, and I can't remember what all the letters stand for, but I know the S is sort of at the basic end, which is substitution and saying, yeah. you know, instead of using um, uh, a notepad to take notes, I'm now writing them on a laptop. Yeah. So it's substitution, augmentation, um, modification, modification, and, and, and um, redefinition. Redefinition, that's right. Um, so 
all the way at the other end of it, you know, and as you move through, it's starting to do things like, well, with a, with a PowerPoint slide, I can introduce interactive polling and things like that. So I'm actually using technology to add new activities and, and, uh, and modify and augment uh, the way that we teach. And at the other end, the R in SAMR, S-A-M-R, is redefinition. Thanks, Tom. Um, and that means using technology to do something that we can't do without technology. Okay, so a, a completely novel thing. And that's what we have with this VR heart and where I think that VR becomes really important because you can have a plastic model of a heart and that's fine. You can get that three dimensional uh, representation of it, but it doesn't move. You can have a video of a heart that moves, but you don't really understand how it works in 3D. With VR, you can reach out, you can grab an actual, well, uh, a virtual heart that's beating, you can investigate it, you can make it huge, you can stick your head inside it uh, and do whatever you like. Um, so the development of this was done dirt using Blender. This is my colleague, Jaris Bounds World, that's far more complex than I can possibly understand. Uh, and then using the Unity um, game engine to actually put it into VR for all the interactive elements. And I can show you um, a flat screen version of this that we developed. Um, which one is that? This one here. Um, for deployment, so we can do this in virtual reality or students uh, after they've had their VR experience can do it on a flat screen device. So hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so there's our heart as it stands right now. You can make bits of it clear and see what's happening inside. We can zoom in on it. And this is actually, even as it stands, a fantastic teaching tool uh, during lectures. I'll even bring this up to be able to walk students through uh, how the heart works. Now, this is just the free play mode, but we have um, a variety of um, actual guided learning activities with voiceover, et cetera, that the students can work through uh, on this as well. So that's, Took about four years, I think, for, for Jairus to, to put that model together. It takes quite a lot of time, but um, it's, it's clinically accurate at this point, and we're really quite proud of it. So they, uh, they can be viewed in various modes on different types of devices? Uh, correct, correct, and mobile devices as well. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, no, so is that, that uh, publicly available or only for uh, University of Melbourne staff and students? Uh, currently only University of Melbourne, um, uh, but um, we're working on getting it more publicly available. I'm happy to put a, a link up in the chat at the end for anybody who wants to go and explore the, the desktop version. You're more than welcome to. Great. Um, I hope I'm back to my PowerPoint here, am I? Yes. Sure. Thank Software you. development. Yep. yep, very good. Um, so some other, just some other things in general that we've been doing with VR. So we've worked with people across the university and gotten them into our little learning studio. Um, one of them is fantastic. It's the tomb of Nefertari, which is now closed off to the public. Um, and they've made a complete VR reconstruction of this tomb. So the only way you can actually see this tomb anymore is through virtual reality. Uh, and we've had uh, ancient Egyptian studies students coming over and literally spending hours in VR just reading the walls uh, of this tomb. Um, so I, so I heard that um, it, was, it was quite an authentic way of learning uh, you know, hieroglyphics as far as the language um, tool goes. And, and um, someone like Neil Cowie might be really interested in that, um, who teaches English. But um, yeah, I thought it was quite a novel way of making language learning really authentic. Mm. And it was great because if you look at sort of in the lower left here, that's that setup we have uh, where students are wearing headsets and you can see on the screen, the instructor is walking around looking at the screens and he has his, um, you know, his, his sort of book of hieroglyphics and the students are trying to puzzle out what the different things are and he's working with them to help them as well. And they even found, uh, I always forget the language, but it's the informal language they used in ancient Egypt. Uh, a student found in some corner of the tomb something that had been scrawled in that language uh, and the instructor was able to translate it and there were carpenter's notes saying this block should be cut to this size and input in this way. Um, so a really fantastic way for them to uh, to explore that. I like um, that, um, Charles, I like the uh, the idea of, of being able to monitor and see uh, and give feedback and guidance to the students who are in a VR environment. And, uh, and, and that's an issue, I think, with the untethered headsets. 
Um, so for example, the Oculus Quest, because you don't have that ability to see what the students are seeing. Um, we're working on a tool now uh, where the instructor can carry around an iPad and bring up the different views of the different Oculus Quests of the students, but that's not proprietary through Oculus. Um, yeah, it really is important. possible to do. We've done it with, um, even with smartphone uh, head mounted units where we basically just uh, mirror via Wi-Fi to an external screen. It's a bit like casting to an Apple TV. Um, mm. A little bit slow. Um, and we've also done it with the Oculus Go. Um, so th there is ways to do it with the uh, with the with the um, with the mobile versions as well. Yeah, we built it into the VR Heart program uh, to have what we called Geppetto, um, the Puppet Master, um, and it was a, a laptop program where it would have every student screen and it was tutor facing, so that you could see which students were having issues, uh, how they were progressing, and the students have an ask for help button that would flash up red on that student screen on the on the tutor facing view. Um, so that was a really nice way for the tutors to be able to manage uh, their students working through the heart program. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important part uh, of, of the whole process when you're talking about pedagogy. Um, I think that, you know, being able to have that feedback between uh, not just the student and the content, which they're doing in VR, but between the, the student and the, the tutor or lecturer, et cetera. So that's, that's really important. That's great. Mm. Um, this was a really fun one that we did. I'm not sure how many of you have done Richie's Plank experience where in VR you go to the top of an 80 story building, the lift doors open and you just have a plank to walk out on. Um, but we used some, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before. Uh, we took our undergraduate students in this little third year subject that I run and uh, we all went up to Eureka Tower uh, in, here in Melbourne and out in this glass box where you look straight down on the city. And we took their blood pressure and heart rate and everything when they did that. And then they did four weeks of conditioning in the VR plank uh, experience. Half of them went up on the plank and the other half stayed down on the footpath. It was pretty boring for those ones, but there it was. And then we all went back to Eureka Tower to see if it actually had an influence on their uh, physiological response to, to height stress. Um, and it was in fact chalk and cheese. The, um, the students who had conditioned themselves in the plank experience uh, had a reduced physiological response the second time we went to Eureka Tower, which was quite cool. It's something that uh, I need, Charles, because uh, I can't hardly even stand on top of a ladder. Well, you can try this one. Uh, I, the first time I tried it, Tom, I couldn't even walk out on the plank. And it's, it's nothing shows you how immersive VR is uh, like yeah. this program because you know you're in a safe room but you still can't bring yourself to, to walk out onto this plank. Um, and the uh, heart rate response to the students when we first went up to Eureka Tower was an increase of about 30 beats per minute, which physiologically is a mild to moderate increase in heart rate. The first time they did the plank experience, it was 50 to 60 beats per minute. So the plank experience actually gave a higher physiological response than being uh, in real life at the top of Eureka Tower. So I hope you had some paramedics uh, present. This <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just a quick question. These are single user environments, right? It's so only one student in the space, but you can have multiple students in the same space, but not together. They're not multi sort of player. That's correct. Um, we are building some of our own tools. So we're developing, um, actually, we were approached by uh, the Arena Theater Company, believe it or not. Um, with our VR heart and they wanted to do a multiplayer thing where students were sort of evocatively handing this heart to each other in some sort of theatrical way. I don't know. I'm not an arts mm -hmm. guy, um, but we created a multiplayer environment for that. And we actually had, you know, one student in Bendigo, uh, another one here in Melbourne interacting with each other in the same virtual space using this heart, uh, which sounds, sounds more like a butcher shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we also developed, uh, we're developing something similar to Nefertari, which is an Egyptian stelae project. So these sort of tombstones um, where we've loaded them into a virtual environment and we're going to make that multiplayer so that the instructor, most importantly, so the instructor can be in there uh, with the students and interacting with them and looking at different things. Um, Quite cool. So we're, we're really interested in that multiplayer thing, I think, because um, VR is very good from that standpoint when you start to think that that makes it borderless, right? It, you know, AR is fantastic, I think, for having, when you have multiple people in the same room interacting with an object, but VR means we can have people all over the world in the same virtual world. Yeah, room, yeah, right? and that, that's, that's where you make that bridge to um, making learning authentic in a remote mode, so it's just not a single user experience. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and, and that's something we're, we've always been really interested in, in developing. Um, the other one that we do, uh, and this has actually been our bread and butter, it's actually probably our most popular activity, believe it or not, is a, is a repurposed party game called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Um, and basically a person in VR has a bomb they need to dismantle, and you can see it on the screen here on the lower left, uh, by solving a series of puzzles to disarm this bomb. The people in their group, not in VR, have the manual on how to solve those puzzles. So the person in VR has to communicate to their teammates what they're seeing on the screen because the, their teammates can't see the screen. Uh, and their teammates have to interpret what they're seeing, uh, uh, give that information back to them and tell the person in VR how to solve the puzzle. And we use it as a, a team building and group work skills activity. Um, because it really does improve or show students how to communicate succinctly, um, how different people in their group can specialize in different puzzles or information, um, uh, and it's just a fantastic activity for group work. Um, we deploy it to lead off our uh, group work projects um, in undergraduate classes as, a, as an icebreaker activity and to get them started, um, and the medical school is using it for uh, interprofessional uh, practice. Um, so that you can get uh, people together from different disciplines, doctors, nurses, etc., together, uh, and understanding that they all have value to add to this experience. So that's actually been a really great activity for us to run. So it seems like uh, the work that you're doing, Charles, is not just for uh, the medical school. It, uh, you seem to be getting uh, it's being used right across the, the university by the looks of it. Absolutely. And my colleague Angelina Fong uh, has sort of established herself as the group work guru. Um, so we've put together a, um, an entire you know, hour and a half activity uh, for team building and group work, um, part of which involves this activity and part of which involves, uh, I don't know if you've ever done that NASA moon landing activity where you've crash landed on the moon and you have to prioritize which objects you'll bring with you. Um, and both this activity and that moon landing activity teach slightly different skills. Um, so by combining those, she's created a really nice group work uh, program. Um, so those are just some of the things that uh, we've been working on so far, and I'm, I'm happy to drill down into any of them in more, in more detail. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how we actually, um, how the rubber hits the road here and we actually deploy this. Um, we have currently 24 student facing um, wired headsets. Um, we were doing this previously with 16. But if you start to add that up, 30 minute sessions per day, this is how we break it up. And we actually deploy the heart in practical, as a practical class. So the students will go and do a proper um, sort of face-to-face -face measuring each other's ECGs, et cetera. And then they'll come over and use our virtual heart. So they do that for 30 minutes. That means we can fit 16 sessions in, in an eight hour day. That means 384 students per day can come through and do this activity. So scaling VR is no mystery. We do it just like we scale any other activity, break the students down into smaller groups, get them to sign up and move them through. So what are the implications um, from uh, COVID-19 now, Charles? Yeah, sure, well, sure we're, it. we're on pause for that at the moment. Yep. Um, we're currently trying to figure out how we can properly sterilize headsets and we haven't come up with a way that wouldn't potentially damage the headsets. Um, even wiping them down with alcohol over and over again, that's going to ultimately damage the plastic and everything else that's part of those headsets. So, but we don't have students on campus at the moment anyway, so we can sterilize the headsets all we want. If nobody's there to use them, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, so it's sort of a non-issue right now. Do you think there would um, be a case for students to buy their own or is, is that just, you know, far too um, exorbitant? Potentially, and it sort of depends on the activity. We've always focused really on, on room scale activities. Um, so the, the cardboards are, are a bit out, um, as are the Oculus Go and some of the other ones, the, the three DOF headsets, because um, most of our activities are six DOF activities. Um, you know, we could encourage students to buy their own, but it's an expensive purchase. Uh, yeah. Even the Quest itself is what, five fifty six hundred dollars $600? And at the moment, you can't even get your hands on them. Um, so they're very difficult to require right now. Um, the group activities that keep talking and nobody explodes activity, uh, because it's one VR headset for a group of say six students, uh, now you can increase your, the number of students you're getting through. And we just get them to rotate through the person who's in VR. So we've had 120 students at a time there in the, st in the studio um, doing this activity. 
I would um, imagine they'd be get, get quite noisy in the. It does, but that's kind of that's kind of part of it. And students are leaning in and talking to each other, and they they really embrace the activity. And there's a fantastic actually buzz in the room. Um, we have some sort of soundproofing boards, and we move those around to help you know dampen it a little bit. But um, uh, it generally... yeah, I'm thinking that sort of ambience and noise would actually add to the environment because that's what happens when you're trying to diffuse a bomb. But uh, sorry, a bomb. <laughs> that's right. Because it's going crazy. It's, oh, it's like, yeah. We've embraced that as being part of it. That's yeah. right. Or you know, in an emergency department, or in an ICU, or any of these places, there are going to be distractions. There are going yeah. to be other people. Uh, it just it just adds to that whole authentic sort of environment, and just makes it more realistic. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Tom, here's some numbers we haven't published yet. I know you like your research and your numbers. So this is our VR hard activity. Um, I'm not going to get into detail of all these questions we asked, but this is a five point Likert scale that we divided into four categories, uh, learning, authenticity, engagement, and usability. Um, so out of, um, we surveyed 99% of the students who did this hard activity. So our N here, I forget is something like, um, uh, 1500 or something like that. Um, and 93% of them either agreed or strongly agreed that um, they were able to identify what they were expected to learn, that they found this to be um, improve their learning about the heart, etc. 94% um, uh, agreed or strongly agreed that it was an authentic learning activity. Uh, through a variety of questions that we asked there. And uh, Tom, if you're, or any of you more interested in this, I'm happy to circulate it with the actual questions and things so you can look at it a bit more closely mm -hmm. if you're interested. 92% um, agreed or strongly agreed that it was an engaging activity. They were able to stay focused. They weren't bored, all of these sorts of things. It was fun, um, which was really important. Um, and 91% agreed that it was, or strongly agreed that it was easy to use, that the system we had set up was, was effective. So we have a little two minute video that we play at the beginning that teaches them how to get started with the headsets and everything so we can move students through efficiently. Uh, and they believe that all of that um, made sense and they were able to move through the session uh, quite easily. So um, have you, yep. have you done, done anything around measuring the impact on students learning? Is there a significant change in perhaps their you know results yeah. their, their so of tom that was this year's job um and i had an honor student who was supposed to be doing that as his project uh this year actually measuring learning outcomes um unfortunately we lost all our on-campus students um so that project has been soccered forward uh, at the moment but basically doing pre and post testing uh combining different groups trying different orderings of the vr activity at versus the flat screen activity um, which is a great control just for how effective is the vr environment and what impact does that have um, but that's a that's a study that's that's um uh, slotted up for the future sure yeah but this one was just um, two aspects. One, what are the student perceptions of the activity? And the other was collecting data on the scalability of the, the activity. So we have a whole bunch of data on um, what were the most common issues, that technical issues, uh, user issues, et cetera. Uh, all of that was recorded um, to be able to comment on scalability and best practice. Yeah, so the other thing that we've done, um, particularly in, in the context of critical care or paramedic uh, education and using VR uh, is triangulating student data via biometrics with their subjective feedback. Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the experience. It was more engaging, etc. But, but using that biometric feedback around heart rate detail and, and uh, did, were they actually under um, physical stress in that VR environment as mm. it was a way of triangulating that data and um, saying, you know, giving you actual quantitative data that, that, that the subjective feedback is actually, you know, uh, backed up by your biometric data as well. So that's another way of doing it. I think I told you, Tom, in another meeting that we had that uh, we were considering uh, a way to actually rig the virtual reality heart up to a heart rate monitor belt so that the heart you are using would actually mimic yes. your own heart yeah, rate. Yeah, get a bit of bio that biometric feedback there. That would probably give them panic attacks. <laughs> Um, yeah. but, but it would be cool nonetheless let's let's be honest that would be very cool 
Um, but that one's on the back burner at the moment now that we've moved into Roslyn. Uh, here's just the last one that I want you to show and I have to want to show you. And uh, this is, uh, I have to credit my colleague, Michelle Rank, who um, has been spearheading this project. It's a virtual knee. Um, and the idea here, this is just a very, very early prototype. We're actually scanning uh, real human bones um, for this through the anatomy department, uh, through their cadaver uh, donor program, body donor program, um, and putting them together. Now, the idea here, uh, a lot of physiotherapists as well as doctors complain that they know that the motions you need to do when doing a knee exam to investigate whether the ACL or the PCL, et cetera, is compromised, but they don't link that to the underlying anatomy. So the idea for this ultimately is to have, you know, here is a clear glass human leg so that you can see the knee and the ligaments underneath it. And as you pull it and move it for in virtual reality in the different motions of the knee exam, you'll actually be able to see highlighted which ligaments it's straining and be able to connect those tests um, to the actual underlying anatomy. Um, so that's a project that we're working on. Uh, currently as well. Um, so one, one of the things that, that kind of is missing in um, VR when you're doing things like clinical examinations is the whole uh, haptic feedback. Um, yes. So is, is there any, have you got any ideas or plans around trying to build that in, you know, what does it actually physically feel like uh, to be manipulating that knee? Because um, when you're in VR, you don't get any of that sensation. Tom, you've hit exactly on the biggest drawback of this. Um, and that's something we've been beating our heads against. Um, we're, we worked together with some actual game designers uh, who have been thinking about this kind of thing a lot. Uh, there's ways to do it through the vibration of the controller, um, but it doesn't actually stop you know, when you're pulling it. There's ways to do it with sort of ramped up other visual cues, um, things getting more and more red as you're, as you're getting to a point of, of pulling it to the limit. Um, and even, you know, having the virtual patient scream at you uh, when, it's, <laughs> when it's hurting them. So there's, there's other types of cues we can build in, but you're absolutely right. You can never get that perfect haptic feedback without doing almost a mixed reality um, type of situation. Um, but that's where we are with that. And I might add, by the way, with the virtual heart, when you hold it in your hand, the controller does vibrate with the beating of the heart. and It actually freaks a lot of students out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, sort of where, we're, where we are now. Um, and I don't, need to I don't need to do the sales pitch to you all about VR. Um, but I think importantly with VR, I've seen it fail before. Uh, and it's when companies took something that they had on a flat screen device and just chucked it in VR and expected it to work. Um, and that's where what I was saying earlier, I think about the SAMR model is really important. Using VR yeah. for activities that you can't do otherwise, not exactly. just taking some flat screen activity and porting it over to VR for the sake of Yeah, it. not just basically recreating a book in VR. I mean, what's the point? Correct, correct. Um, now, I, I know I'm taking a lot of your time, but I just wanted to show you one more thing that we're very, very excited oh, no, about. You, you're it for today. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, then that's that's great. Then I will do that. Uh, I'm taking you back to this screen share. Um, this is something taking us out of VR and immersive reality here for just a moment um, that we've been working on in the Digital Learning Hub for the past um, couple of months. It's called Roslyn, and it's a uh, web-based uh, adaptive learning framework. Um, this was to replace Smart Sparrow and uh, a lot of the content from the best network that we had been using. Um, and we've developed it to have a lot of different functionality and we're still building it uh, as we speak and we will be continue to build it uh, for quite a while. So it has um, branching capabilities. So that sort of adaptive branching question tree uh, type thing. I'll start over here and show you. This is just, um, we've created modules about bananas just because why not? Um, so you can see here, um, you have a drop down with your learning objectives. Uh, That's something I've always wanted to know. What's the difference between a banana and a plantain? Well, actually, Tom, a plantain is a type of banana. And the banana that we think of is called a dessert banana. Uh, and a plantain is a cooking banana. Well, there you go. I've learned something. I mean, you can go through and do this module and learn all sorts of things <laughs> about this. Uh, so you can select different things. Uh, here's plantains. If we want to go to the taxonomy of plantains, for example, that will take us to that, that page. So it's ad adaptive and branching. 
Um, we also have the capacity uh, to do specific types of feedback. So if you have a, a, a multiple choice question, you can have different feedback pop up depending on student answers, or, or you can have it take them back through more fundamental questions uh, in a classic adaptive learning style. Uh, it has the capacity for um, high resolution slide viewers, um, which was something that we've also lost. We're paying $50,000 a year for this. Uh, my JavaScript guy mocked this up in a day and a half. Um, so, so money well spent there. Um, you're able to zoom in um, at high resolution detail on these slides. It maintains its resolution. You're able to collaboratively annotate. So if I highlight a section of the slide here, or the instructor does, or a student does, that will appear uh, on everybody's uh, slide when they access uh, the program. What sort um, so of file sizes are you dealing with here? Uh, these ones are relatively large, Tom, probably about, um, about a gig, I'd say, for one of these. Uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering about the practicalities of, of this, if this is done remotely, um, you know, Wi-Fi speeds and data yeah. caps and stuff like that. These aren't as bad, Tom, as the um, 360 degree images uh, are, <laughs> uh, or more importantly, the 360 videos. Um, so the other thing we put in here are um, the ability to put in 360 images or videos. Um, you can also add hotspots to these so that you can click on areas or regions of interest and bring up more information about those, uh, or you can go into web VR. Uh, on it as well. Um, so you can do this with, um, uh, like I said, with images or video. Uh, I have a video built in here, but it takes a very long time to load because it's huge. So that is a problem yeah. that we're- So what's the back end of this, Charles? Is this just using um, JavaScript? JavaScript. Yep. JavaScript. And it's so all it's completely really web-based. It's completely web-based, which means that, you know, you can create a module and you can give it to anybody that you want. They don't have to have a subscription to Smart Sparrow or any of these other tools. It's completely web-based. Charles, is it open? Is it open source? Or can... uh, as of right now, no. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking this would be great as a plugin for H5P. It looks very similar. Well, what we're, we're actually trying to beat H5P wow. at the moment. And a couple of things we think are a bit better with this. Um, first of all, uh, from a University of Melbourne perspective, we own this, we can brand it, we can put anything we want on it. Uh, and because we also own it, um, you know, we have people from around the university saying, it would be really great if I could do this particular thing. And we say, cool, I'll build that functionality in for you, right? We can build that tool for you. The other really nice part about this compared to H5P, and I'm not sure how well this will work here, um, is that this is adaptive to mobile devices. There isn't a second mobile page, literally as you, um, uh, it's not gonna work with that, oh, there you can see it. As you resize the screen, the user interface actually changes to adapt to a more mobile friendly interface. Okay, so, um, and, and it, it's more evident on pages with menus, et cetera. Um, yeah, and it also reduces the onboarding. Um, you don't have to download an app, you just use your web browser on your mobile device. So. Correct. It's quite and it, it does a really nice job uh, across um, desktops, laptops, uh, tablets, um, mobile phones, any size that you're using, it automatically adapts to your screen size and, and throws a user interface at you that's quite friendly. H5P is a lot more awkward with that. Now, what we don't have on this yet is um, an academic facing authoring environment. Okay, so right now it's just a JavaScript framework. Um, the authoring environment is coming, uh, I believe by semester one next year. So okay, we'll so you still have to now. be a nerd to develop it at this point. Sort um, of. You need to be a nerd to develop <laughs> it from the ground up, but we're currently developing an editor so that if a module exists, and we're hoping to have that by the end of this month, if a module already exists, there's an editor that you can go in and change text or change out your image or things like that. But the actual construction of it needs to be done by somebody who has at least basic JavaScript understanding. Yeah. Charles, I just have a question about um, just bringing up the comparison between SmartSo and H5P and this. Does it integrate, is there a way to integrate it with um, our grade center for assessment purposes or is it something that you'd have to do separately? Um, so the next thing coming is LTI integration. Um, so basically, Right now, uh, it uses cookies to track student progress. 
Um, so for example, here we have, you know, the ability to see how far you've come through these various modules, what your progress is, et cetera. But that's just browser based at the moment. Okay. Um, the LTI integration is the next step that we're working on. Uh, and that will use Canvas, the LMS for those of you who don't have Canvas. Um, to uh, take care of the authentication step for us. So Canvas will take care of the login, and then we can have this behind Canvas um, uh, doing the authentication and even the security for it as well, if you want to make sure that nobody else can access it. Um, and then that will be able to record student progress. And we're also building academic and student-facing analytics dashboards for it as well. Um, so students will be able to benchmark their progress against other, uh, other students. Um, and one cool feature actually that we're going to try to build into those student facing dashboards is by tagging individual uh, slides. Um, so I can say this slide has, um, you know, this particular learning objective, uh, this slide has this particular learning objective, etc. You'll be able to take your analytics dashboard, break it down by learning objectives and understand how you benchmark against your peers on questions about that time on task, etc. Is that something we could potentially be using for um, graduate attributes and outcomes and sort of mapping curriculum and is it a lot? It's very exciting. It's, it's very <laughs> exciting. That's right. That's right. And uh, we, have a, we have an LTI in for further development of this. I should, I should um, disclaim. Uh, we have an LTI in for further development of this at the moment. So I'm hoping Gregor and David Israel will, will, will think the same. Well, I'm um, in the FlexSet looking, project. So importantly, we're, look, we're not looking to replace Canvas. We're not looking to do anything like that. We're looking to have a platform that that we can uh, customize our own functionality and develop things that Canvas can't do. And importantly, consolidate a whole bunch of other things that we currently use through third-party tools. You know, right now we use Poll Everywhere for this and we use Piazza for this and we use Smart Sparrow for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're trying to pull all of that together into one platform. Uh, one thing we'd like to do even with the, the questions that we have there is have sort of an asynchronous uh, histogram that builds up after you answer the question that shows you how all your peers have answered that question as well. Um, so almost a, a, an asynchronous poll everywhere type tool built into it also. Um, so that's really what we're looking to do with this. And the idea that you can put 360 content in it, yes, there are websites where you can do that, but this you can actually embed it into a greater module and you can have follow-up questions and you can have hotspots and all of that. So. We're hoping it's going to be sort of a one-stop shop for being able to deploy um, online guided content or activities for students. And where did the name, name come from, Charles? Roslyn. Roslyn, does anybody out there know? Any nerds out there? Oh, is it the, um, the, the place they were going to storm this year? Um, the, some US base, secret base? No, that's Roslyn, oh. New Mexico. That All is, right. <laughs> no, this is a Battlestar Galactica reference. Okay. I let my, my lead developer uh, got, to, got naming rights, and he's a big Battlestar Galactica fan. And Roslyn was the education minister come president in uh, Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> okay, right. Well, they've run out of names from Greek mythology now, so I think that's a good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, Keenan, you can name it whatever you want. He's done a fantastic job. And I'll just point out, by the way, um, this I, I don't mean to be diminutive when I call him a kid. He's 22 years old. I hired him straight out of his undergraduate, which he did with me as well. Um, he didn't know how to use JavaScript and in six weeks learned JavaScript and built everything that you see here. I have a 13 year old who might like to do some work experience with you, Charles. I'll send him along. <laughs> six weeks. I mean, it's very impressive. So, I mean, that's just to does give it, you does a Does he have a girlfriend? But he does not. <laughs> that's, just, that's just to give you a taste of how quickly this has been coming together and how quickly we hope to accomplish yeah. the, the rest Hopefully he doesn't watch this video, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, we've also had a very talented uh, award-winning actually learning designer uh, from the Department of Physiology who's worked with us on setting up the user interface and such as well. Uh, who's that? Uh, Joanne Tay is her name. Oh yeah, I know her name. So we just hired her in, in physiology for, um, um, yeah, for, for uh, developing a lot of the online content for FlexApp, but we've borrowed her over in the Digital Learning Hub to help us with this stuff as well. That's what She's I formerly a, key, a Kiwi. She worked on um, uh, a whole software suite. I forget what it was called. Uh, I don't think David's still with us. It's called Te, Te, Tekura or something to that effect. Um, 
but yeah, I did a really nice job with it over there. I've uh, met so anyway. Joanne. We were in FlexApp. Um, I'm on the FlexApp program, so I've met her through that. Oh, right. Okay. That would make sense. That would make sense. Um, so that's everything that we've been working on. We have our fingers in a lot of pies, as you can tell, but we're always excited to develop new things. And and Roslyn has really been, you know, us switching from our face-to-face -face VR activities, which we were really, you know, focusing on before, to our sort of COVID-ready um, development of online, de development and deployment of online content, um, which is not only applicable now going into semester two, um, but also uh, I think going forward for any sort of flex app related blended learning that we might want to develop and deploy. Well, thank you very much for your time, uh, Charles. It's been really interesting, to, great to see the, the projects that you've been doing and um, great to see that you're really embedded in, in pedagogy and what you're trying to actually achieve in teaching and learning, which is fantastic. So are there any questions from our illustrious panel at this point? <laughs> Looks like I covered it all. I think we were kind of asking questions as we went. Yeah. I do, uh, I do hope though to follow up with you at some point, Charles, about all of this because um, FlexApp is something that both Annabelle and I are deeply involved in. And uh, I work on some of the LTI stream as well as the plus 300. And as you were going through this, uh, I think as with Annabelle, the ideas just started churning and churning. So I won't monopolize the time now, but I would love to, uh, to, to grab a Zoom with you at some point in the next couple of weeks, maybe, and we can, we can talk turkey. Yeah, I'd like to, to do the same. Maybe we could do that together. But I think I'm not particularly tech myself, although I want to learn JavaScript now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's the affordances of these things that I'm probably, you know, seeing being able to scan across the university. I'm going, oh, yes, that'd be great for walking through the ancient agora because that's <laughs> sort of my background. But um, it's particularly if you are doing something that we can use across the university and it's privacy okay then it would that that idea of being able to cover a lot of the things that we've got if we know that there's not going to be a problem with the privacy impact assessment and using it then then all of a sudden you know the opportunities and uh, are so so much broader than a lot of the things that we want you want to use now or we can't use now mm. and it does kind of bring me back to uh, one of my early points about uh, the scholarship of technology enhanced learning and um Get it, getting you know this stuff published and out there so that other people can learn from it, Charles. So a bit of a plug for our um, special collection of the journal Research and Learning Technology. Um, so we've had a uh, kind of a rolling uh, collection of immersive reality in higher education for the last two years, and this will be the third um, update to that collection this year. So you know if you've got some spare time to start actually working on publishing what you've been doing. We'd most welcome you to submit. I'd love to have that spare time, Tom, but I yeah. think given that what I just presented is 40% of my job, um, I think you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can understand why I don't have much of it. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but I would love to, uh, to work with somebody a bit more seasoned in that space as well. And I think that's why I'm pleased to be involved uh, with this group in particular, um, because I would love to start getting, we have the data collected. Uh, it's just a matter of writing it up and getting it out there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So nice to have a contact with CSAG. Uh, on that as well. So um, following up with what you said earlier, uh, Chris and Annabelle, just feel free to send me an invite and I'm more than happy to meet up. Um, I'll add that Ben Loveridge from Learning Environments, yep. um, the immersive guy, um, he's part of my operating committee in the Digital Learning Hub uh, as well. So we have a, quite a close relationship with Ben also. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And David Israel and Gregor Kennedy drink at the same pub that I do. So uh, <laughs> I walk past it. They're like those two guys from the Muppets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The show's terrible. Yeah, their attitude's about the same as well. But every time I talk to them, I say, you know, I think we should build our own platform. They say, just calm down, Charles. You're too ambitious. Like, I'm just going to build one anyway then. <laughs> yes, the dollar signs. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I think, one of the, I think one of the nice parts about this too, I'll just, I'll just, to, just to finish off, is that Unlike things like Smart Sparrow and these other third-party apps where they build them and then sell them on to somebody else, uh, and we're always scrambling and jumping from one platform to the next, you know, if we can actually get some persistence with Roswell and then we can actually say, look, this is something that will stick around for a while uh, and we can use um, ourselves. Well, fingers so. crossed. I think that sounds like the, if you need to um, any uh, sort of 
opportunities and affordances to make a case. Uh, <laughs> 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 we might not, I mean, I, I know what, what Gregor, what, what the two guys from the Muppets are going to say, but um, we could we could help to support that case. I think I can certainly see some opportunities there. That'd be great. We've been talking to Gordon Yao from over at LE as well, oh, yeah. about LTI integration, etc. Oh, awesome. So, yeah. Oh, good. I do think that's an important point though, Charles, is that often people um, get so carried away with, uh, you know, the aspect of making money off, off a good idea that they, they end up forgetting the, uh, the aspect of what it's really for is around teaching and learning and, you know, how can we make that freely available rather than make money, huge mon money out of it. So uh, Yeah, much to the university's chagrin, Tom, that's, that's sort of my focus at the moment, which is yeah. the, the teaching and learning, not the, the commercialization. Yeah, uh, but, I agree. You know. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was awesome and uh, great. So I will uh, put this up on YouTube if there's anyone that you wanted to uh, point it towards um, or, you know, you could use it yourself for a bit of promotion. So, yeah. And I put links to everything that I just pointed out there in the, uh, in the chat um, to the Rosalind. Now forgive that Rosalind demo. That's Keenan's dev page. So that's subject to crash and break at any point in time. Um, but go feel free to go and have a look and, and poke around if you like. It should be fine for at least a few more days or a week or so. Cool. Right. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. I just wanted to mention that I, put, oh. I, <laughs> I, I put a link to um, a little teaching and learning story video that we made with Brent Davis, who's the mm. academic that's teaching the Egyptian language subject. Yep. Um, yeah, the, it was Brent that we were working with on that. Yeah. 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 So um, if anyone's interested, have, have a look at that because it actually shows what the students see when they've got the headset on, shows them pointing out, recognising the hieroglyphics. So you might be interested. Okay. In well, I'll, put, cool. I'll put that into the uh, description on the YouTube video then as well. And uh, the DLH has a website as well, Tom, if you could whack that in there too, that would be great. Cool. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Yeah.